لذلك لما شاء الله أن يزيد ورثة الموعد بيانا لعدم تحول عزمة توسط بالقسم حتى نحصل بأمرين لا يتحولان ولا يمكن أن يمكن الله فيهما على تعزية قوية نحن الذين التجأنا إلى التمسك بالرجاء الموضوع أمام أضمامنا الذي هو لنا كمرساة للنفس أمينة راسخة تدخل إلى داخل الحجاب حيث دخل يسوع بصابق لأجلنا قد صار على ركبة ملك صادق رئيس كهنة إلى الأبد السلام لك أيها الكريم strength to his people. Bring unto the Lord, ye sons of God. Bring unto the Lord glory and honor. Wisdom. The reading is from St. Paul's epistle to the Hebrews. Let us attend. Brethren, when God made a promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And thus, having patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For people indeed swear by what is greater, and in every dispute of theirs, the oath is final for confirmation. So when God, being minded to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel, he interposed it with an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, we who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us, a hope which we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and entering into that which is within the veil, where Jesus entered as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Peace be to thee that readeth. Holy 
gospel, peace be to all. And to thy spirit. It is from the holy gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to thee, O Lord. Glory to thee. Let us attend at that time. A man came to Jesus, kneeling down, and saying unto him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a dumb spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And Jesus answered him, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has he had this? And he said, From childhood, and it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You dumb and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when Jesus had entered the house, his disciples asked, asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. They went out from there and passed through Galilee, and Jesus would not have anyone know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after he is killed, he will rise on the third day. Glory. We have a, a special treat. Um, father Gregory Rogers, my father, is here visiting with us. And he gave a wonderful retreat yesterday, and he will also offer this morning's um, homily. So, probably there. And then, of course, fasting. Fasting is not just a diet. You've all heard this joke before, but dieters die with a T. <laughs> Sometimes that's how, how we feel about it. Yeah, blame the town that you were. Right? <laughs> uh, fasting isn't just about changing our diet, though. Fasting, it, and St. John of the Laver talks about this extensively. And, uh, it, it, he, he puts fasting as the chief weapon by which you knock back those demons. By the way, you can kick them off of that ladder and keep them from... from why is that? Well, because the, the sin... Is like a, a, a passion that grabs us. And fasting helps us to learn how to catch that process of passion and sin earlier. Let me give you a little illustration about that. Um, I love cookies, oatmeal, and raisins, in case you're picky. No, it's <laughs> and if you see a cookie, right, what begins to happen is you think, oh, a cookie. Now, the fathers call that a momentary disturbance of the intellect. <laughs> That's a fancy phrase, right? I've noticed that cookie. Now, there's no sin there, right? The second stage, though, is, oh, I love cookies. I love that oatmeal. I love that, oh, that raisin. Oh, man. I just, and I can just taste it from here across the room. That's called coupling. We couple with the temptation. 
third part is ascent. Oh, I'm going to have that cookie. And we start to walk across the room. Now, according to the fathers, moral, moral culpability begins to, to hit in the coupling stage, but it's really there in the ascent. As soon as you said, I'm going to have that cookie, you're guilty, whether you get there or not. The truck hits you on the way across the road to get the cookie. You're still guilty of the sin that was attached to that. I'm not saying it's a sin to eat a cookie, but <laughs> Now, if you give in and you get across there and you eat that cookie, then you begin to develop a propensity for that, right? Every time you see a cookie, you go, cookie! And in fact, by, before you're even really thinking about it, what's happened? You have seen the cookie, walked across the room, picked it up, taken a bite of it, and then you realize that you have been tempted. That's the, the developing of a passion. That momentary disturbance of the intellect leads to a coupling, which, which leads to assent, which leads to action, actually participating. And that leads to a habit pattern, which is a passion. How do you break that pattern? Fasting. Where's the fasting come in? I'm not going to eat the cookie. You see what I mean? I might want it. I'm not going to go get it. Because that, that it strengthens our ability to recognize and resist. And the Father's teaching, St. John of the Ladder, clearly, explicitly teaches that if we can resist the temptation of eating food at some level, we can learn how to resist the temptations that come to us in everyday life, and we can resist those, those, those demons. One deeper meaning, too. How did Adam and Eve get into the trouble that they were in? They ate, right? By our fasting, we are putting ourselves back in the garden, and we are not eating. See what I mean? So that gives us weapons by which we can fight. I believe, help my unbelief, prayer and fasting. The last thing I want to, to point to today, though, um, that helps us on this season is to see where we're going. To see where we're going. In the uh, epistle reading in Hebrews, it, 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 it talked about we have this hope as a sure anchor of the soul. That which is going to keep us going. We're not going to be kept going so much by the power of by the power of will. You know, any of you who have tried to lose weight know that. Or, you know, it, it isn't will that keeps you going. You have to have some vision of what, what, what it, it is coming. And if we're living a life in this world that is taking up our cross, we need to have a vision of what is going to be at the end of it. For our, the Pascha season, for the Lenten season, of course, the, the, the proximate goal, the thing that we're going to be reaching for in just a few weeks, is the celebration of the resurrection of Christ itself. Jesus, Jesus says, I go to my cross, but he goes to the cross that he might trample down death by death and upon all those in the tombs bestow life and raise them to new life. Yesterday at our retreat, we talked about uh, the second coming of Christ, and we spent a lot of time talking about the, the difficulties and the struggles and the things that come in, in this world and how we're fighting that battle, and we kept saying, those that endure to the end will be saved. And I felt kind of bad at the end of the day that we'd been focusing, it felt, almost entirely upon the negatives, you know? There is, though... For those of us who are in Christ, a sure and certain hope. The goal that Christ has is to recreate all of creation. To establish the kingdom of God, not just in part, but in full. Not just momentarily where we get glimpses of it, like we are doing today when we come into the church and, and partake of the resurrected body and blood of Christ. 
but to see the glory of the Lord in all its fullness and to be with him and to live in a world in which the devil has no more power over us and sin has no more power over us and that those weights that we carry around in us are taken from us and the, the, the illnesses of our souls are healed. That's what we're waiting for. And in Revelation chapter 21, we see a reflection of, uh, of that. Prophet John has been seeing this, this vision, and he says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. A new heaven and a new earth. Everything that is here present now that is corrupted by death, that is corrupted by, by evil, will be washed clean, will be made new. I don't know exactly if it means that he'll burn everything up and start all over, or if it'll just be the, this, this rejuvenation thing where he comes through and just makes it all fresh. But it's going to be new. A new heavens and a new earth. And then he says, also, there was no more sea. No more sea. Now you might think, what is that about? Is there no beach in heaven? That's not really what he's talking about. What was the sea in Revelation? That was the place from which the beast came, right? Evil came out of the sea. And there's no more sea. And in fact, there's no place for the evil to come from. It's gone. Nothing is remaining that is evil. That's a world that we're looking for. Then he says, I, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What's that bride? The church is the bride of Christ, right? He has given his life so that he might prepare himself a bride without spot and without blemish. And the New Jerusalem is not really a place. It is a people. Jerusalem is the capital. Jerusalem is the place where God dwells in, in, in the scriptures, right? And, and where does God dwell? He dwells in his people. We, St. Paul says, are being built together as a dwelling place of God in the spirit. We are living stones, St. Peter said, laid upon the foundation, being raised up into a spiritual house. We are the temple. We are the Jerusalem. We are the place where God dwells. And the new Jerusalem is going to come from heaven. All of God's people who have died before us, who have fallen asleep in Christ, who are there with him, are going to descend with him, and we're going to ascend if we happen to be alive at that time. And then we shall all be together with Christ, as St. As Saint Paul also said. And John then says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. What was the tabernacle? That was that special building in the wilderness. Remember the tent where the people went to meet God and to worship God, where the Holy of Holies was. And that was replaced by a permanent structure of the temple. And so here he says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. By the way, in John 1.14, when it says, uh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the word dwelt there is actually in Greek the word tabernacle, and the word became flesh and tabernacle among us, and we beheld his glory. So it, it, uh, John was picking up in, in his gospel that image of that tabernacle being the presence of God in the wilderness and the temple being the presence of God in Jerusalem. And Christ is the tabernacle and is the temple. And we, in union with him, are the temple and the tabernacle and Jerusalem. I love it. Mm -hmm. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them 
and be their God. Now here we go. This is what I was talking about, that sure and certain hope, what we're looking for. In the midst of Lent, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of difficulty, hear this verse. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. That is what I'm looking for. That is why I am willing to take up my cross and follow after Big bone in Shari 